So in the previous videos, we have actually seen what information we can gather by analyzing energy band diagrams. So in this video, I'll be explaining how to draw those diagrams, both in equilibrium and non-equilibrium conditions. So I'll be taking example of a PN junction to illustrate the process of drawing these energy band diagrams. So let's get started with the case of equilibrium. So firstly, we have to understand what is the electron energy distributions in the material so that we'll get a sense of how the electrons move when two materials are joined. So we already saw that the electron moves from the material having the higher Fermi level to the material that has lower Fermi level. But instead of just telling higher and lower Fermi levels, we use this concept of work function. So work function is actually defined as the energy level difference between the vacuum energy and the Fermi energy level. It is denoted by phi. So what I mean by vacuum energy level is, suppose you have a block of semiconductor. The amount of energy that is required to move the electron out of this block. So that is what we define as the work function. So basically what we are trying to tell is, as the Fermi level is closer to vacuum energy level, the energy required to remove the electron from the material is lower. That means the electron can easily come out of the material. Suppose you have two materials which has work function as phi a and phi b and phi a is lesser than phi b. That means the electrons will move from material a to material b. So it is really important to understand how the electrons flow based on the energies rather than just thinking about their concentrations. So suppose in an PN junction, we commonly think that the electron concentration on the N side is high. That's the reason electron actually diffuse from N to P side. But we also have to understand what is the energy distributions inside the N and P material. So basically electron not just moves based on the concentration gradients, but their main objective is to move to a lower energy levels. So we can take a simple example of a metal semiconductor junction and we can see that if the metal has higher work function compared to that of a semiconductor, then the electrons will move from semiconductor to the metal rather than from metal to semiconductor, even though we know that metal has a lot of electrons compared to that of a semiconductor. So this is the first step. That is, you understand what is the electron energy distributions and you understand how the electron moves between the materials. So once we know this, we know one more important concept that the Fermi level is constant in equilibrium. So what we do is we draw the constant Fermi level. EF. And the next thing we do is we draw all the other energy levels relative to this EF. So we know that for an N-type, the conduction band is close to the Fermi level. And for a P-type, we know that the valence band is close to the Fermi level. This is the valence band for the N-type. And this is the conduction band for the P-type. Also, let's draw the intrinsic Fermi level that is denoted by EI. So from the earlier discussion, we understood that the electron moves from the N type to the P type. So that is the electron moves in this direction. Similarly, the holes will move in this direction. That is holes will move from the P type to the N type. So at the interface, we know that the concentration of electrons on the N side is lower and the concentration of holes on the P side is lower. So let's try to draw this intrinsic Fermi level based on our understanding of this electron and hole concentrations. So we know that in the N side, the electron concentration is reducing. That means the distance between EI and EF is actually reducing. Similarly, on the P side, we know that the hole concentration is lower. The distance between EI and EF is reducing. And just a reminder that the concentration of electron and holes is actually an exponential function of the difference between EF and EI. So even for a small change in EF and EI, there is an exponential change in the concentration of electrons and holes. So now that we know how the intrinsic Fermi level moves, it's easy to draw how the conduction and valence band moves. We just replicate the same thing in conduction and the valence bands. So now we see how the intrinsic Fermi level plays as a reference when drawing energy band diagrams, as well as when analyzing the energy band diagrams. And the intrinsic Fermi level is almost at the middle of the band gap. That is the distance between EC and EI is equal to half the band gap. And this is constant everywhere in the diagram. So this is how we actually draw the energy band diagram for the non-equilibrium condition. So just to summarize, the first thing we see is what is the electron and their energy distribution so that we understand how the electrons move. And the next thing is we know that the Fermi level is constant. So we draw the constant Fermi level. And the third thing is we actually draw all the energy levels relative to the Fermi level. And the final thing is we draw the intrinsic Fermi level based on our understanding of this concentration of electrons and holes. So once we know how the intrinsic Fermi level changes, the conduction and the valence band just follow the same thing. 
So next we'll see what is the procedure for drawing these diagrams in case of non-equilibrium. So for this example, I'll be applying a voltage to create this non-equilibrium condition. So basically what I'll be doing is on the P side, I'll apply a positive voltage and on the N side, I'll apply a negative voltage. And this is what is commonly referred to as forward bias of the PN junction. So we'll see how the energy band changes on applying this voltage. So first thing is, we have to first understand how the bands bend when you apply voltage. So we know that the electrostatic potential energy is actually given by minus Q times V. And this minus is coming because we are drawing for electrons. So from this equation, we can see that if we apply a positive voltage, the energy actually goes down. So to illustrate this with a simple example, suppose I have a semiconductor. This is the conduction band and this is the valence band. So now what I do is I just connect a battery across this semiconductor. So from this equation, we can tell that the positive side of the energy bands will actually go down and the negative side will actually go up. And just a reminder that this is the direction of increasing uh, electron energies. So by applying the voltage, we saw that the positive side of the semiconductor will have the bands bent downwards and the negative side of the semiconductor, the bands will bend upward. So basically your energy band will look something like this. So this is how the energy bands bend on applying the voltage. All right. So now let's go back to our example of the PN junction. So in this case, we are applying a positive voltage on the P side and the negative voltage on N side. So basically the P side moves downwards and the N side actually moves upward. So now we have to actually see what happens at this uh, PN junction. Now, since we have applied a positive voltage on the P side, we can see that there is a lot of electrons that is being injected from N side to the P side because of this applied positive potential. So basically the concentration of electrons just after the junction is actually increasing. So therefore a single Fermi level cannot actually explain both the concentration of electrons and holes. So what happens is the Fermi level splits into quasi Fermi levels. So there is no change in hole concentration. So this stays at EFP whereas the concentration of electrons is actually increasing. Therefore the Fermi level bends towards the conduction band. Similarly, on the N side, since we have a negative voltage, we can see that there are a lot of holes that is being injected from the P side to the N side. So therefore, the Fermi level on the N side also splits into quasi Fermi levels. So the concentration of electrons is not changing. It is constant. It is EFN. But we see that the concentration of holes is actually changing because of this injection. So what happens? It bends towards the valence band. This is EFP. And in the depletion region, it is constant. So this is how the Fermi level split in the non-equilibrium condition. So to draw the band bending for conduction and valence band, we just draw the intrinsic Fermi level. So the band bending for the intrinsic Fermi level just stays the same. So just the level of the bending has just been reduced because the bands on the P side is actually pushed down and bands on the N side has been pulled up because of the applied potentials. Similarly, the conduction band and the valence band follow the same band bending similar to that of the intrinsic Fermi level. So this is how you draw the energy band diagram for non-equilibrium condition. So just to summarize, in non-equilibrium, we see how the bands bend based on the applied voltages. Once we know how the bands bend, next we'll see how the Fermi level splits based on the electrons and hole concentrations. The next thing we have to do is just draw the intrinsic Fermi level. It'll be just same as it was in the case of equilibrium, just that now the band bending will be reduced based on the applied voltages. And finally, the conduction and valence bands will follow the, the similar band bending that of the intrinsic Fermi level. So this is how you actually draw the energy band diagrams for both equilibrium and non-equilibrium condition. So that's the end of this series on energy band diagrams. So I hope now you understand how to draw these energy band diagrams both in equilibrium and non-equilibrium condition and also analyze these energy band diagrams and extract information out of them. So thanks for watching and see you in the next one.